don't forsake the fellowship with one another keep learning the scriptures and understand that they're actually all pointing to christ whether it's the law the prophets or the wisdom writings or whatever it is it's all pointing to christ uh he's doing his best to do a salvage project to prevent them from doing what they ought not to do which is turning their back on their newfound faith in christ Dr. Witherington, it is a pleasure, sir, to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, it's good to see one of our former doctoral students again. Yes, sir. Well, I, I'm excited to dig into the, um, the letter, the sermon, the homily of Hebrews. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, before we get started, I suspect most folks who have uh, have ever watched you know the history channel or uh, or or some you know some tv show something like that around christmas time or easter or something they probably have seen you they probably have heard of some of your works but to give us just kind of a brief introduction to uh, maybe how long you've been teaching where you're teaching and, and what kinds of things you're interested in dr witherington can you tell us a little bit about yourself um, well, I've been at Asbury since 95, but I've actually been teaching for close to 40 years. Wow. Uh, I taught at High Point College and then at Duke Divinity School, and I've taught at Gordon-Conwell Seminary at Vanderbilt. The longest 10 years have been at Ashland Seminary in Northeast Ohio for 11 years, and then here now for 26 years. So mm -hmm. I'm just plain old at this point, you know. I didn't want to but say it, but <laughs> I still love teaching. It's it's a great thing, you know. Yeah. It, one of my things I often tell my lay people is find a job that you love to do, and then it won't be like work. It'll be like pleasure. Yeah, and it really is. I I just enjoy it, uh, and and I love researching and writing as well. So it's uh it's been a a, a good journey with my wife of 43 years and mm -hmm. uh you know we are we're grandparents now so woohoo that's great uh, yeah uh, we're 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 enjoying each of the seasons of life and things are going pr pretty well good good um <clears throat> i had the uh, i had the fortune of being able to take you for i i, I think at least one class while I was there, and then also had uh, had you on my dissertation committee, and that was that was a lot of fun. I really appreciated your comments on there. Um, it gave me exactly what I needed to know, right? Just quick to the point. Hey, check this, check this, check this, and uh, you know, away we went off into a defense uh, last uh, was it last March? Well, are we still in twenty twenty? <laughs> what year is no, this? Pretty not. <laughs> yeah, not, not not so much. No, not so much. A, no, year, a year a year and a bit ago to say the least that's but right yeah, yeah. and yeah. we're glad that you've landed on your feet because you know getting teaching jobs at this point is tough it's a it's a wild market i uh I, we were talking before the interview started that i could do some adjuncting get to do a lot of uh teaching here at the at the church where i'm at mm -hmm. and uh, I, we're in a really good spot um especially down here on the coast minus the tropical storms that's uh, currently hitting at the time of recording uh other than that Food is great. Friends are great. Church is great. So, so far, things are going pretty well. That's wonderful. I'm, yes, I'm really glad. Well, let's dig into the book of Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews is kind of a perennial favorite of some folks. And Hebrew is, is kind of strange and mystifies other folks. And so I'm hoping that we might be able to do a little bit of demystification of, uh, of, this, of this book that... Um, uh, that is it, it's rich it's it's dense and um you know, i think that this will be a fun fun conversation uh, dr witherington help us out at first um what is the genre of hebrews what's its literary type and, and and what does that tell us about about the author's aims and i do say author because there's some debate right um 
yeah, maybe. Do you want to start with authorship, or do you want to start with the, with the literary type? Uh, we can do both because they are actually intertwined. Okay. Uh, when you're dealing with something like Hebrews, the first thing to be said is these are oral documents. Mm -hmm. They were not supposed to be sort of silently read in the privy of your study. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole cultures were oral cultures, and so orality and ways of speaking orally were primary and writing was a decidedly secondary thing. It wasn't a culture of texts. I mean, maybe 15% of the population was literate. Yeah. I wish I could, I mean, could at least read mm -hmm. or less than that could write or at least write well. So one of the things that's rather surprising about the New Testament is so many documents and one of the most interesting is certainly the book of hebrews mm -hmm. uh, the book of hebrews does not start like a letter at the end it does have a sort of postscript that indicates that this document has been formed in one place and sent to another place mm -hmm. that, that's clear but in fact the beginning of this document like for example the beginning of uh some other documents in the New Testament, First John would be a good example, mm -hmm. shows that we're not dealing with any kind of traditional letter or even Jewish Christian letter. We're probably dealing with a sermon. Okay. And a whopper of a sermon too. Right. I mean, 13 chapters, plan to listen for about two and a half hours, right? <laughs> this is not 20 minutes in a cloud of dust. Yeah. And it is also not McNuggets. Right. Not putting the cookies on the bottom shelf. This is not what's happening. No, he's trying to elevate their sense of who they are and where they are and what they should be doing. And he's going to challenge the, the sandals off of them, you know, in, in, in this letter. Yeah. Basically, this sermon is addressing Jewish Christians. Mm -hmm. we're very fortunate to have it in the canon because as the church became progressively more and more and more and more gentile that's one of the reasons this book became more and more and more mysterious to many of the the fledgling christians that were giving their life to christ uh, yeah. all over the mediterranean crescent and throughout the roman empire and so you have to understand some things about early Jewish Christianity and early Judaism mm -hmm. to really make sense of this book. Uh, another reason that you have to understand that is because it is chock-a-block full of quotations from the Old Testament, yeah. which the author assumes that the audience will either recognize or know a little bit about. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the structure of this sermon is based on a series of quotations which then lead to an exposition of the quotation and then another quotation and then there's an exposition of the quotation and so on and so on and so on and uh so it's a, an intertextual feast mm -hmm. and if you're not prepared to swallow the old testament whole you may get indigestion or if you're not familiar with the way that he's using the Old Testament, you may find say, "What? Yeah, uh, it, well, this is this is too highfalutin for me." Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's rich, and it requires uh, continuous attention to understand. It is a sermon. Yeah, that yeah. is textually rich, both theologically oriented texts from the Old Testament, and also ethically oriented text and and if i would want to stress we 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 must not overemphasize the theology at the expense of the ethics mm -hmm. because the real aim of this document is what is called paranesis which is not as opposed to a pair of nephews paranesis means you caught me off guard with that one <laughs> ethical exhortation yeah ethical exhortation mm -hmm. and here's why the author of this document, which in my opinion is, is, is another Jewish Christian who's really knowledgeable about the Old Testament, 
the best candidate I can find in the New Testament is Apollos. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly not Paul. I mean, if you read the document, the way he uses the Old Testament, the kind of arguments he makes, yeah. the emphases he has, the way he presents Christ as the heavenly high priest, this is all not Paul. Yeah. Now, there's evidence he knows some Paul. He knows a bit of 1 Corinthians. He knows mm -hmm. a bit of several other letters of Paul, early letters like Galatians. Somebody from the larger Pauline circle, I'm putting my money on Apollos. Yeah. The person. And clearly not an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus. There are a couple of telltale places in the document where he indicates that he's relying on the testimony of those who were earlier than him in regard to various of these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it's an ethically oriented document to a group of Jewish Christians who are under pressure, if not under persecution. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking about, he's worried they're thinking about, a, about going native. That is about crawling back into their Jewish shells, yeah. not opening their mouth about with the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's concerned about what he would call apostasy. Yeah. That is forsaking Christ or crucifying Christ again, to use a phrase that, that shows up, uh, you know, in Hebrews and you're going, what? Yeah. Yikes. You know? And so, exactly. So, the whole focus of this is to prevent that kind of leakage, mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, sort of fading back into the Jewish woodwork to avoid persecution from whoever is going to do the persecuting. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the orientation to the document. Mm -hmm. Don't forsake the fellowship with one another. Keep learning the scriptures and understand that they're actually all pointing to Christ, whether it's the law, the prophets, or the wisdom writings, or whatever it is, it's all pointing to Christ. Uh, he's doing his best to do a salvage project to prevent them from doing what they ought not to do, which is turning their back on their newfound faith in Christ. Yeah. I really like how you point out the structure here where he it seems like there's a series, right, of quotations and then expositions on kind of what, what he is quoting here. And you mentioned a term that for folks who run in biblical study circles is, is just you know, a very common term. You mentioned this term intertextual. Uh, for folks who, um, for folks in the in the audience who who might not be familiar with that term, help us uh, flesh out what intertextual means and and how how the author of Hebrews is 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 you know, pleasantly guilty of this. Well, like many good preachers, he's going to cherry pick stuff from the Old Testament that makes his point, and he's going to insert it into the sermon at crucial junctures to. Uh, from a rhetorical point of view, this is what you call an inartificial proof. That okay. is something that is recognized as being authoritative for the religious life, which if you insert it into the document as a, aha, I got you thing, they go, oh, well, it's in the Bible. I guess we have to say yes or yes or three bags full, you know. So he's, he's doing this quite deliberately. And it's intertextual in that he's not trying to give them an arid lecture on the meaning of the Old Testament in its original context. No, he's like a preacher who's preaching for a verdict. He's selected text that he thinks is going to help convince the audience using the Old Testament as a, as a sort of backup for his otherwise very interesting arguments as well. Yeah. And many of the arguments are surprising. I mean, for example, he uses Psalm 8 early on mm -hmm. in the book of Hebrews, which is actually not Christological. It asks the question about humanity in general. What is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou shouldst care? But, but thou hast made him but a little lower than the angels. And the author says, well, you may not have thought of this before, but actually there's an echo here that points to Christ, right? Yeah. That's intertextuality. Using Old Testament texts, many of which are not inherently Christological at all, to, to say, 
all along, God was preparing the way for this person that you're now thinking about abandoning. Stop the boat. You need to get off wherever yeah. you think that boat is going. Yeah. So that's kind of, he. what I would say is he uses the Old Testament homiletically like we may do in preaching because it's directed towards the audience. It's not directed towards doing contextual exegesis of the Old right. Testament. Yeah, for, uh, for folks who are kind enough to listen to this and have had some formal training in biblical studies, what the author of Hebrews appears to be doing seems to be very different from the kinds of things that, that you and I have been trained to do in, uh, in preparing, say, you know, research papers or things like that. Right. It seems like what a lot, of he's, a lot of what he's doing is taking something like what you mentioned, Psalm 8 there, that's not it's not inherently, it's not overtly Christological. It doesn't obviously point us toward the Messiah, but then he can, you know, the author of Hebrews can take that and say, well, you know, in a sense, we could faithfully apply this to Jesus, you know, given you kind of, if we look at it from this way, um, you know, borrow a line from Star Wars, from a certain point of view, we could kind of see how this applies to Jesus. Is, is that a, maybe a fair characterization of, of yeah, what I the author does? Right. And I think, I, I think, that that's how homilies in synagogues mostly worked. So, for example, Jesus goes to his hometown synagogue, Luke 4. Mm -hmm. They read the Isaiah scroll. It just happens to be a passage that's talking about the year of Jubilee, mm -hmm. which is not inherently about the coming of the Christ, but does say things about the liberation of the captives and, you know, the giving sight to the blind and these sorts of things and jesus just sort of rolls up the scroll and hands it back to the scribe and says by the way this was fulfilled today in your hearing and they're going what you know? <laughs> yeah. really it'd be it'd be like your preacher getting up in the pulpit on sunday and saying and by the way mr 666 is this political figure somewhere in america and you're going really huh i never thought of that yeah you <laughs> yeah right so it, it it there's an element of surprise here in the christological way he's using this material yeah yeah we've got a sermon then we've got a sermon that draws deeply from the old testament yes. uses it in ways that uh, that are uh, creative and surprising to the audience. Help us uh, dig into some of the major themes of Hebrews. Sure. We could, uh, we could start with, maybe we could start with angels or Moses or you know, whichever one of those you wanna, you wanna well, dig into first. Well, the first thing he's doing from a rhetorical point of view is eliminating what I would call counter arguments. Okay. So what he's doing right off the bat is in the language, that he's going to use in the south we'd say mo better right <laughs> angels are great jesus is mo better that's right yeah this is really really good jesus is mo better he's not trying to put down any of the stuff right. in the old testament or the, yeah. the major old testament figures it'd be a bad move for a, a group of jewish christians right yeah moses yeah. Eh, we could do without him right <laughs> yeah right and like you know exactly but what he is, is, he is doing is making what we would call an eschatological argument. He's saying all of these figures were preparatory. And when you get to the real, one of the real climaxes in Hebrews 11, he's going to say from Abraham right on down to Jesus, they were all looking for a city they never saw. Mm -hmm. They were all looking for a kingdom that did not happen, right? And, and so... He's going to say, these are good, but they're preparatory for what is better. And what kind of crazy person would forsake the better for merely what was good in the past, yeah. right? So that's the kind of argument he's going to make. He, this guy's greater than the angels. He's way better than Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's one-stop shopping in Jesus. He's the heavenly high priest. He's the one sufficient sacrifice that makes all other previous sacrifices odious or unnecessary. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the temple. 
you know, or he's at least he's entered the heavenly temple and applied the blood. So y'all are good. Yeah. Uh, why would you want to apostatize from the fulfillment of Old Testament religion? That's like, you know, that's like a no brainer kind of question when you mm -hmm. put it that way. Yeah. And so for a Jewish Christian, they're going, oh, oh, no, I certainly don't want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. that's been my whole life. And so, you know, he works his way through a series of arguments, one of the most important of which has to do with Psalm 110, verse 4, that the first question that a skeptical Jew would ask about this argument is, wait a minute, Jesus was not a Levite. He was not an Aaronite. He was not a Zadokite. Mm -hmm. He was not a Qumranite. How could he possibly be a priest? Yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? Shazam, Psalm 110.4 says, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And you see, the way they thought was always what's more ancient has more authority. What's earlier is likely to have more authority or more clout. Melchizedek is before the Levitical priesthood. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Abraham, the founding patriarch of this world religion, you know, he honored Melchizedek, right? And, uh, and so the author is going to use what is called typology, which means there are figures in the Old Testament many of them historical figures who foreshadow an even greater figure who does even more along the same lines okay so jesus is said to be our heavenly high priest after the order of melchizedek and he's a priest who doesn't just serve in a temple in like jerusalem he he offers the sacrifice on earth he takes the benefits with him to heaven and then consummates the whole project in heaven, in the heavenly temple. Mm -hmm. So this is an earth and heaven spanning, spanning temple, unlike any temple on earth, yeah. right? And so, I mean, it's a powerful, big argument, unlike any of the Pauline arguments. Paul doesn't argue this kind of way based on Leviticus. Now, the other part of this argument is he wants to say, because the better has come and has fulfilled the scriptures, those previous things are becoming obsolete. Mm. The Mosaic covenant is becoming obsolete. The Levitical system is becoming ab obsolete. And the fact that he doesn't say it's already obsolete because the temple's gone is a clue that this was written before the destruction of the temple in AD 7. One would think that a, a momentous occasion like that would deserve a mention. Yeah, I, I think that that's a... Especially in this argument, in this exactly. argument about priests, temples, and sacrifices, you know, at least, oh, by the way, that whole system went down for the count in 1870. <laughs> yeah. Right? That doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. I, my money is on this being written sometimes in the early 60s, yeah. when there is already pressure and persecution on Christians, partly from the fire in Rome, but also elsewhere as well, because there are more and more Christians. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's trying to save the bacon of Jewish Christians by saying, you, you need to recognize that this is the fulfillment of all your hopes and dreams and fears of all the years, and uh, don't give this up for a mess of pottage like Esau did. Yeah. Don't do it, you know. And, and, and he's, it's clear from, from chapter six that he's really worried about apostasy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk for a minute about that. So this is an yeah. ethical-oriented argument. Mm -hmm. What is apostasy? It is a willful, conscious rejection of the Christ and the gospel. Uh, you can't, from the author's point of view, you can't lose your salvation. You can only rebel and throw it away. Mm. I mean, that, you know, there's a lot of loose talk about losing your salvation. The New Testament doesn't affirm that you could lose your salvation like you lose a pair of keys. Yeah. It's not the, not the notion of, of the New Testament. No, what he's talking about is having tasted of uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit 
and had spiritual benefit and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then, and then turning away, that's like crucifying Christ again, says the yeah. author. You really don't want to go there. Yeah. You really, that's going to be b -b bad to the bone trying to do that, mm -hmm. right? And, and so there's that strong warning against apostasy. And I would just say, if apostasy was impossible for genuine Christians, we would need this document. I think that's fair, yeah. We do need this document because however unlikely it is for most Christians, it is a real danger. It mm. was then, it is now. You're not eternally secure till you're securely in eternity. Short of that, there is some peril. Now, at the same time, the author wants to say, greater is he who's in you than any of these forces in the world. He's, he's wanting to say, God has a stronger grip on you uh, such that circumstances, neither death nor life, nor powers nor principalities can rip you out of the hands of God. But the one person who can mess you up is you. And that's what apostasy is about and is warning is being warned against in Hebrews 6. So that's kind of uh, one of the major motifs. And of course, as opposed to that, Mm -hmm. trying to show them that the long pilgrimage of faithful persons in Hebrews 11. The truth for them was faith is the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction about things not yet seen. That is, it's a forward-looking faith. It's not looking back and saying tradition, tradition, tradition. No, the, the, the faith in Jesus Christ is a forward-looking faith to looking forward to the consummation. And uh, so, I mean, one of the things that's really spectacular about Hebrews 11 is he's going to contrast uh, the theophany on Mount Sinai that scared the living daylights out of the Israelites at my, Mount Sinai with the coming consummation when Christ returns and there's a new heaven and a new earth and all of that. And it's a spectacular uh, soon creases from a rhetorical point of view, comparison of similarities and differences between these two theophanies. And he say, we are going forward. We're looking forward. We're pressing on to this final theophany when Christ comes back. And uh, short of that, we need to not be like Lot's wife and look back, yeah. you know, and, and become a pillar of society, <laughs> right? So, because that way, that way lay, lies madness, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's not going to help you, uh, to say the least, you know. So, it's a powerful argument. Yeah. Very theologically rich, very ethically rich. I, I would say it's kind of like eating marzipan. You need little bites of this at a time. It's so loaded and rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I've, uh, that I'm glad you mentioned was the connection with the discussion of apostasy in Hebrews 6 with the really discussion of, uh, of faith in Hebrews 11. Uh, I didn't, Prepared to mention this to you ahead of time, um, but can we talk about this notion of what faith is right. in Hebrews? It, it seems like it's more than just some sort of intellectual assent, right? There's there, there's more to it than that. Sure, I mean, obviously, the first paradigm of faith uh, is Abraham, mm -hmm. and if you go back to Genesis 12 and read 12 through 15, and then on to 22, actually, uh, it says. Abraham trusted God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he went off on this pilgrimage on the basis of that trust. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing to be said is that we're, we're not primarily, in the first instance, talking about faith in a series of doctrines or propositions, right? Yeah. Now, now, we're talking about a living relationship with God such that you trust this person. 
and you trust him not only for the present, you trust him on into the future. And, and that, I mean, if you read Hebrews 11, um, what comes with that trust is assurance, blessed assurance, mm -hmm. right? What comes with that trust is assurance for the future, that no matter what happens to you, even if you end up martyred like this long list of martyrs he's going to give in Hebrews 11, nobody can touch your eternal salvation. Nobody can take that away from you. I mean, God has got hold of you, and you're okay so long as you continue to trust God. That's the facts, Jack. So, yeah, in the first instance, faith has to do with trust that leads to assurance and conviction, and conviction. Yeah, yeah. And so taking, uh, taking chapter 11 there, it seems like as he goes, as he moves from this uh you know faith hall of fame into chapter 12 seems like there's you know, kind of his final thrust of of exhortation and encouragement um can you walk us through this notion in chapter 12 here you know this cloud of witnesses laying aside these things you know looking to jesus uh, walk us through kind of his argument there in the in the last uh last real chapter of the book or last two chapters please well Arch Archbishop Langton, who clearly as the Archbishop of Canterbury had far too much time on his hands, made a mess of the division of chapters because really chapter 12, one through four, six should goes with chapter 11. Mm -hmm. The ultimate example of somebody who trusted God and came out the other side to the good is of course jesus yeah now big point if you have a translation that reads he's the author and finisher of our faith burn it <laughs> <laughs> the word our is nowhere in there. any greek manuscript yep. no he he is if you will the alpha and the omega the mm. pace setter and the completer who runs the race of faith and trust in God before us sets us the ultimate example that's greater than all the previous ones in chapter 11. He's the final grand finale example of trust in God. Yeah. Of course he is. And he ran the race. He finished the course. He got the accolades. And so you have this spectacular image of Christ as the Olympic runner, mm. as Usain Bolt of early Judaism, <laughs> right? Yeah. He's yeah. out distancing everybody, and he's shed the, the weights, the dumbbells that ancient Greek runners would run with, and he's not looking back. He's only looking forward, and the people in the stands, it's like a football game with everybody going nuts, standing and cheering him across the finish line because his victory is our victory and his success we don't we don't just have vicarious success in watching somebody else accomplish it right. what he accomplished he accomplished for us i mean think about it jesus is the one person for whom jesus didn't need to die yeah what he did on the cross and rising from the grave was chiefly not for his own benefit but for ours. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was the ransom for the many because he didn't need to be ransomed. Right. And he did it freely and willingly, trusting God. Yeah. You know, nevertheless, says Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. Now, another wonderful aspect of Hebrews is this picture of Jesus as a genuinely human person who had all kinds of temptations and suffering, yet without sin, mm -hmm. right? Showing the ultimate paradigm of how to live a good ethical life, right? So, it, I mean, it's it's one-stop shopping in Jesus. He's, he's, he's done what God wanted the human race to do. He's accomplished the goal. He's finished the course. He's provided salvation. Why in the world would you exchange all of that legacy and heritage for a bowl of soup? Yeah. I mean, come on now, or a kosher sandwich. 
Okay, no, no, that's all obsolete, says the author. We are going forward towards the great finale. Yeah, and so this notion here of faith in Hebrews 12, uh, it, it's more about Jesus's faith or, or, or fidelity, right, than it's about faithful, our... is faithfulness. Now, this is another thing about the Greek word pistis. Mm -hmm. It can mean either faith or faithfulness. And uh, sometimes the faithfulness of Christ, even unto death, is highlighted. Sometimes the trust of Christ in God is highlighted. And sometimes his belief, his, his actual belief in the Heavenly Father and, and the whole kingdom project uh, it is highlighted, which is the same for us. For us, faith is trusting God, it's believing in God, it's believing in God's word and what he promises and what he says is going to happen. And, and then living on the basis of that faith and faithfulness. Faithfulness is faith lived out. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's, uh, that definitely drives, uh, drives home the ethical point that the author here is, uh, is 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 trying to trying to emphasize yeah. why leave the better for the good exactly. why why apostatize yeah yeah uh, and in fact you may remember the old saying the good is the enemy of the best mm. well our author is actually saying all that stuff that came before was a blessing from god but my goodness me why would you just eat one little planter's peanuts when you have a Reese's peanut butter cup here? Come on. Yeah. You know, really, give me a break here. Reese's peanut butter cups are my favorite candy, so I, I'm more than oh, happy me to. Too. Me too. I grew up with these things. It's the one thing I ask for for Christmas all the time. You know? I'll, uh, I'll know what to send you as a, as a kind thank you for joining us today. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I, you know, if there aren't any Reese's peanut butter cups in heaven, I'm coming back. You well, know? <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a second there, Ben. Don't, uh, why give up the, the better when you, for the good? <laughs> well, yeah. But, but the, the way this book concludes is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. because when you get to past 12 into 13 there's some very pragmatic pieces of advice yeah not the least of which is do not neglect the fellow join together in fellowship with one another one of the chief causes for defection is isolation mm -hmm. or feeling that you're alone it's just little old me and i'm going to get creamed yeah right so he's going to exhort them keep going to those worship and fellowship meetings. Keep gathering together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and remember that Christ died outside the city, right? You may have to go outside the city to find those meeting in the catacombs or wherever they are meeting mm -hmm. to, to join in the fellowship at that place and at that time. But, but that's what you need to do for reassurance and realizing that you're not alone. It's not just that God is with you. It's that the, the people of God are, are with you as well. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, so there's this final sort of poignant exhortation in chapter 13 to keep on keeping on. Yeah. That's, a, that's especially apropos for this uh, last year and a half when a lot of folks uh, it, for various reasons couldn't make it to um, make it to their assemblies yeah and they had to find creative ways uh creative ways to do so yeah. yeah but at the same time i mean one of the constant comments i have is oh we're very thankful for the zoom but it's nothing like praising the lord together or giving each other uh, a a fist pump or you know uh, yeah. uh and having actual koinonia with one another breaking bread together all those mm -hmm. sorts of things you know and i think one of the things that we have learned from pan a pandemic is that full body worship can't be done remotely you gotta go yeah <laughs> you need to be there i mean you know i mean okay it's great to watch a football game on tv sure 
but it's nothing like being there and yeah. just getting immersed in the whole group experience and seeing it live and in color in person, you know. Yeah. So I, I think the pandemic has just made us thankful for the technology, but make it, made, it, made, made us realize it's but a poor shadow of, of the real thing. And of course, that's what the author of Hebrews is saying about Hebrews. What's come before is partial and piecemeal, he says in Hebrews 1. What's yeah. come is much more richer and full-bodied, and it's life-changing. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to give up the life-changing. Yeah. But you mentioned the, you know, actually watching a football game all together. Uh, you're a baseball fan, is that right? Red Sox? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm living and dying daily with their flirting with disaster or <laughs> making the playoffs. Sure. I was, uh, I was in my, my buddy's dorm room, freshman year of college, 2004. We were watching oh. that. All oh. I had to do was say the year, right? And you know what's coming. Well, you know, I, I, I can hardly explain to you how that really changed the psyche of New England, of so many people in New England. Understood. But I'll give, you, I'll give you one example. Yeah. My homeboy, James Taylor, was born in Boston, grew up throughout his young life in Chapel Hill, and then went back to Boston. And his grandmother was a diehard Red Sox fan. All her life, never saw any World Series victories, right? Yep. She's on her deathbed in the hospital in October of 2004. <laughs> yeah. And James is right there with her, right? And his granny lived long enough to see the Red Sox win mm -hmm. the World series yeah and die happy die very happy right and and then james tells the story of how the next day in the whole next few weeks if you went by graveyards all over new england there would be little red Sox flag <laughs> next to the tombs of That's people funny. who rooted for the red Sox all their life but never saw this yeah right. yeah you know i mean it's it's that kind of perseverance and mm -hmm. faithfulness to something in 2004 really was life-changing and of course they've won three more times in 21st century they won more than anybody else in the world <laughs> right 21st yeah. century. So, so it's all good we were there uh i was there with uh with friends in uh in a dorm room watching that whole thing transpire and it was it was a electric just being in a room with like five or six other guys yeah. watching this imagine then like you're talking about actually being there in person in the assembly imagine being in Fenway in the midst of all that and you get a taste right you get a taste of the kind of heavenly fellowship that the the author of Hebrews is driving the the folks to to remember hey this this is here this is for y'all exhilaration and the sheer joy I mean I was there in Boston in the 1975 World Series with the Reds, right? So close. If Louis Tiant had just been able to pitch four games instead of three, I think we would have won that World Series, you know? But uh, I remember what happened when Carlton Fisk hit that home run at the end of game six around the foul pole and waved it fair, you know, the famous scene of waving it fair, right? I was in my wife's living room. She at this point was just my next door neighbor with various of my friends who were just diehard Red Sox fans. And we were jumping up and down. My best buddy, Rick, nearly broke his head on her chandelier. <laughs> I mean, the exuberance. Sometimes I think about all of that. Yeah. If only th we were that exuberant in our worship of God, you know, that mm -hmm. much joy, that much exuberance, that much excitement. Yeah. Well, we ought to be. That's how the earliest Christians were when they gathered together and got to praise God. They yeah. they were just full, full throated mm -hmm. in their joy. Yeah. Dr. Witherington, as we kind of wind down our time together this afternoon, um, uh, maybe share, if you don't mind, um, a little a little personal side of yourself. What's uh, maybe one of your favorite passages out of Hebrews, and, and would you mind telling us why that's uh, that's a favorite? Sure. Well, f for me, there's 
a lot to choose from. Mm. But but for me, Hebrews 11, 1 through about 12, 7, you know, yeah. to me is the most point. It's, it's really the climax of the sermon. It's sort of, there's a denouement or downhill after that, and that's fine. But when you get that picture of the dual theophanies in chapter 12, mm -hmm. and you're going, whoa, you know, we're going to a better place, uh, a better theophany, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. T to me, that's really moving, you know. And, and so for me, the climax of the letter is, is the... It's got the most juice. It's got the most pathos for me. And very often, you know, whenever people ask me about my faith, I just recite for them Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. It's the assurance of things hoped for mm -hmm. and the conviction about things not yet seen, you know. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not about what I got just right now. It's always looking forward. You know, uh, it's a forward, it's a, Christians should not be dwelling in the past or just turning to the past and trying to back their way into the future. No, that's not how the earliest Christians were. And they suffered far more than we have. I mean, they not only suffered from persecution, prosecution, and execution. I mean, there were three major pandemics they went through. Mm -hmm. to get up to the time of Constantine in the fourth century. They, they yeah. killed hundreds and thousands of people, right? This did not stop their faith. Yeah. And neither will this pandemic stop ours. Amen. Amen. Dr. Witherington, I really appreciate your time with us uh, together this afternoon. This was a, a, a delightful conversation, and uh, I know folks will, um, will be encouraged to remain faithful. Thank you very much, sir. You are most welcome.